So hi and welcome to this NPTEL course entitled Feminist Writings where we're looking at Donna Haraway's The Cyborg Manifesto. So we've already started with the essay and it is a pretty profound essay in terms of looking at the entire idea of humanness, the entire idea of human identity, uh, gender identity in a postmodern world. Uh, and we look at the point today where she talks about some of the paradigm shifts which have happened in a postmodern technocratic world because uh, it, it's important to remember that the historical setting that she's talking about over here is late 20th century capitalism uh, and late 20th century uh, technocratic capitalism where technology uh, becomes a very important instrument uh, not just in the public space but also in the private space where technology affects not just uh, the way we convey, uh, the way we communicate in the public world but also the way we um, experience intimacy, uh, the way we experience uh, you know, very, very human affective experiences. So in that kind of a setting where technology becomes a very important, a major instrument of uh, uh, sort of conveyance and communication and interruption, then what happens to the entire, you know, the entire identity of human, animal, machine, organic, inorganic, etc. So she's talking about uh, some of the crucial paradigm shifts that has happened, that have happened uh, historically uh, with the sort of growth of 20th century uh, technology. So, uh, and then she I mean, in the section in the screen at the moment, she talks about the three crucial boundary breakdowns that makes the following political functional analysis possible. So she defines, uh, she maps out three paradigm shifts. She max, maps out three uh, boundary breakdowns, which are quite important to study uh, for the purpose of historicizing the, the emergence of the cyborg. So uh, as she goes on to say, and this should be on the screen, by the late 20th century, um, in the U.S. scientific culture, the boundary between human and animal is thoroughly breached. The last beachheads of uniqueness have, have been polluted, if not turned into amusement parks. Language, tool use, social behavior, mental events, nothing really convincingly settles the separation of animal, of human and animal. So the first uh, big break that happens with the rise of technology in late 20th century is the, in the boundary between human and animal. It, it breaks down. And she says that, you know, we can't really demarcate uh, so clearly anymore. And uh, the word pollution is very important over here because pollution or more specifically contamination becomes a very important category in postmodernism where everything gets contaminated. So there's nothing pure anymore. There's no sense of pure identity uh, or purity when it comes to identity. Every identity becomes a contaminated category, which is something that um, Haraway talks about quite so clearly. Uh, and she says, oh yeah, you know, these have turned um, almost into amusement parks. And amusement parks is a very uh, interesting metaphor for postmodernism because what happens in an amusement park is uh, the world we live no outside is turned into a toy world. And that toy world, that, that conversion to a toy world is also an act of defamiliarization. We, we have machines which look like humans, we have animals who look like humans. So the entire distinction between human, animal, machine uh, sort of breaks down an amusement park. An amusement park is not really an innocent space. It becomes a very discursive space in postmodernism where machines can simulate reality, where machines can anticipate reality. So it, it becomes, again, it becomes a contaminated category of existence. So all the uh, uniqueness, unique entities about human beings, language, tool use, social behavior, mental events. So all these uniqueness, the unique attributes begin to break down, begin to get contaminated until we come to the point where nothing convincingly settles the separation of human and animal. And many people no longer feel the need uh, for such a separation. So that's the other important thing and that's the attitude of postmodernism which one needs to be uh, mindful of because, you know, this break from the pure idea of humanness, this break from the pure idea of Eurocentric humanness, to be more precise, begins to happen uh, from early 20th century. But if you look at modernism, you find that there's a sense of nostalgia which creeps in, where people are acknowledging the break, where people are acknowledging uh, you know, the, the loss of the old order of humanness, but they are mourning it. They are nostalgically looking back at a world which had the order intact. Uh, so the attitude is one of you know, sadness, the, um, the attitude is one of, you know, mourning. Whereas when it comes to postmodernism, it, it celebrates this break, it celebrates hybridity, it not just acknowledges it, it celebrates it in a way which makes it a playful possibility, right? So people don't feel the need uh, to, uh, to have the separation anymore between animal and human because, you know, it just becomes a very interesting 
contaminated category, which becomes a happy uh, celebratory contamination in some sense. So indeed, many branches of feminist culture affirm the pleasure of connection of human and other living creatures. Now you find the birth of animal studies as a discipline and you know, the growth of feminism, the consolidation of feminism as a discipline, uh, they sort of m overlap with each other quite significantly, not just temporally but also attitudinally. Uh, so we find uh, the, the entire idea about animal rights, the entire idea about doing away with the primacy of man as a primate uh, and then sort of looking at man as just one more species in this entire interspecies uh, world we inhabit. So that comes uh, with a further consolidation of feminism. So feminism, feminist culture and uh, the entire kinship with other living creatures, you know, that discipline, those disciplines sort of merge and overlap with each other uh, quite interestingly. So movements for animal rights are not irrational demands. Uh, uh, so not, not irrational demands for, of hum, human uniqueness. They are clear-sighted recognition of connection across the discredited breach of nature and culture. So human rights, animal rights, uh, feminism, they all merge into each other. And, and the whole point is to do away with the primacy of man, the primacy of the gendered man, the hegemonically gendered man. So biology and evolutionary theory over the past two centuries have simultaneously produced modern organisms as objects of knowledge and reduced the line between humans and animals to a faint trace, re-etched in ideological struggle or professional disputes between life and social sciences. Within this framework, teaching modern Christian creationism should be fought as a form of child abuse. So, you know, this is a very provocative sentence with which this paragraph ends. And what Haraway is essentially saying is that, you know, if we still believe in the Christian creationist story uh, about, you know, man coming from Adam and Eve, etc. That kind of knowledge narrative or narrative of knowledge is so disseminated and conveyed to children. That should be not just stopped and banned, but should be classified as child abuse. Because, you know, and obviously by abuse she means uh, abuse at a level of knowledge or epistemic abuse or epistemic violence for the matter. And she's saying that, you know, we, we need to acknowledge the fact that, you know, if we still continue the creationist narrative, uh, in this diverse world where you know, not just the primacy of man but also uh, you know what has been established is the entire kinship between man and other living creatures. So in that kind of environment, in that kind of um, uh, setting, in that kind of historical situation, uh, we should put a stop, put an end to the entire creationist narrative about you know, the biblical story about man and animal and uh, man and woman, etc. Right, so, so that's, that's the uh, first distinction that you know, Haraway is pointing out, that the you know, difference between man and animal is you know, breaking down, and that, that breakdown is a happy breakdown because it's being welcomed and celebrated and acknowledged and articulated by uh, feminist critics, you know, animal rights critics, postmodernists, etc. And that, that is very much a part of the entire cyborg um, narrative that she's trying to sort of describe. Now we come to the second big break. Uh, that is the second leaky distinction is between animal human organism and machine. So first we have the animal and human distinction being broken away and, and, and the borderlands are blurred away, etc. The second leaky distinction is between the animal human, the, the organic order and the inorganic order. You know? So we're looking at it's almost like a Venn diagram, we're looking at a subcategory man and animal, that, that category, the, that categorical division breaks away, so that becomes one category. And then you come to the next one, where you know, organism, man, animal together, and machines. And even that division has been done away with uh, in the current culture of postmodernism, as you know, Haraway goes on to uh, describe. So uh, she talks about how pre-cybernetic machines could be, could be haunted. There was also this, always a specter of the ghost in the machine. So you know, she talks about pre-internet, pre-cybernetic machines. Because uh, remember, uh, and I need to keep telling this throughout the lecture, that the historical setting is very, very important for the essay. She's talking about uh, late 20th century technological capitalism, which is pretty much the time when the internet was coming into being, where you know, the entire you know, connection, the entire idea of information and, uh, and the knowledge is being revolutionized through different and you know, plural, several paradigm shifts, etc. Now, she talks about how even in the pre-cybernetic machines, you know, there was the idea of machines being haunted. And of course, we can think of examples such as uh, people were uh, afraid of being captured in the camera because there was this belief that the camera can steal someone's soul, uh, it can capture someone's soul spiritually. Uh, so all these narratives about ghostliness, about spectrality were there uh, in early machines as well. So this dualism structured the dialogue between materialism and idealism that was settled by a dialectical progeny called spiritual history according to taste. 
but basically machines were not self-moving, self-designing autonomous. So there was this dialectical division between material and spirit, uh, which was pretty palpable uh, with the rise of the more, you know, early 20th century machines. But even so, uh, those machines were not self-driven. Those machines are not uh, intuitive machines. Those machines had to be monitored, had to be worked on by the human. So the human agency was pretty palpable. So the human agency when it came to machines, when it came to operating machines was pretty much there. So machines are not self-operating, machines are not self-decision making or self-designing or autonomous in that sense. So they could not achieve man's dream, they only mock it. So those machines could only mimic man's dreams, they could you know, just mimic it, but they could not achieve man's dream in that sense. They were not man, an author to himself, but only a caricature of that masculinous reproductive dream. So the machines over there, you know, at that point in time, early 20th century, were more like, like caricatures of man's dreams, of you know, union, of utopia, etc. To think they were otherwise was paranoid. So to think that machines had a will of their own, machines had an uh, intuition of their own, machines had a drive of their own, to think of those terms was, you know, people would consider you to be paranoid or mad. But now she goes on to say, now we're not so sure. Because now we're not so sure that machines don't have a will of their own. We're not so sure that the machines don't have an intuition of their own. Because they do, do seem to come up with uh, certain actions which are you know, intuition driven actions, which are decision driven actions. So we're not quite sure uh, if machines are not autonomous in quality or machines are not agentic in quality anymore. Because they, there seems to be uh, a, a sense of agency in the way the machines operate uh, in this kind of setting, in, in a sort of late 20th century technological setting. So late, now we're not so sure. Late 20th century machines have made thoroughly ambiguous the difference between natural and artificial, mind and body, self-developing and externally designed, and many other distinctions that are used to apply to organisms and machines. So what are the borderlines which are blurring away? Uh, mind and body, natural and artificial, self-developing and externally designed. So all these mapped out territories have, have, you know, have been done away with, and now the distinctions have been blurred away. And now we have a more interesting entanglement, a more complex entanglement of man and machine in a way which had never happened before historically. So our machines are disturbingly lively and we ourselves frighteningly inert. So, and this is a point, this is a sentence which proves one more time, you know, the prophetic quality of Haraway's essay because, you know, when she was writing this in 1984, uh, the internet was just being conceived as, um, uh, as a design. It wasn't sort of disseminated across the world. But now we have internet which has invaded not just the public space but also the private space and it's actually done away with the distinction between public and private space entirely, the internet. So you can be sitting in your little room in some place in the world, uh, in, in a small place, in a small town, uh, in a small room and still be connected to the entire world to the v different virtual networks. It could be Instagram, it could be Facebook, it could be Twitter, it could be anything. But that virtual world is very much a public space where you can have you know, debates, you can have disagreements, you can have opinions, you can have discussions uh, in, uh, infinitely. And that space can be occupied, can be inhabited infinitely. It's a permanently plastic space. So in that kind of a setting, we uh, can be completely inert. So we can be just sitting in one place and doing nothing really, where machines do all the work for us. Uh, and the machines can take decisions for us, machines can intuit uh, intentions for us. Uh, machines have intentionality, machines have intuition, mach machines have self-decision making ability. So that, that entire uh, borderline between the decision making, intuition having, uh, agentic human and the passive performing machine, that, that borderline is completely done away with because we have machines now which are actually lively and autonomous and decision making and, and self-driven uh, in a very interesting sense. So that, that, that's a very important distinction. Uh, that has happened, the paradigm shift, the new kind of machines, the new age machines, the late 20th century, as Haraway goes on to describe it. So, uh, and that's something that, you know, Haraway is very, very interestingly, uh, you know, commenting and, and, and prophesizing that, you know, we will come to a point where machines will do everything for us, and we will become machinic and passive and, and agency-less, where machines will take over in terms of uh, control. Uh, and communication. So a third distinction uh, that Haraway points out uh, is a substitute of the second. And the second distinction was obviously the, the separation between the organism and you know, the machine. That, that was done away with. The third distinction is between the boundary between physical and non-physical is very imprecise for us. So you know what is tangible and what is intangible in a postmodern world is something which is uh, fiercely contested, is fiercely debated uh, as uh, 
as, as a category because you know we have all these uh, questions about tangibility and intangibility about what is abstraction what is material uh, so you know the very idea of culture the very um, body of culture is a very interesting example of this because a culture you know can be abstract can be material can be a combination and both can be you know uh, a very hybrid entity, but you know, cultures are dependent on material things, you know, and likewise, technology today uh, is done, doing away with the entire idea about, um, you know, organism and inorganism, the physical and the non physical, etc. So, that is something that Haraway is pointing out. That, uh, and she goes on to say, the pop physics. So, you know, she's talking about physics uh, the way it has been disseminated in popular culture. Pop physics books on the consequences of the quantum theory and the indeterminacy principle are kind of popular uh, scientific equivalent to Hollywood romances. Hollywood romances are the Mills and Boone's kind of romances, which were very easily consumable narratives. As a marker of radical change in American white heterosexuality, to get it wrong, but they are on the right subject. So, pop physics books, uh, she says, are the modern scientific equivalent of Mills and Boone's romances, and she says that that is pretty much the uh, the, the movement at the moment where uh, you know the entire distinction between the physical world and the non-physical world through a quantum understanding of time and space uh, you know is being dissolved away. So, there is no mapped out division between the physical and non-physical at all and that is a very important uh, uh, category, a very important breakdown, very important paradigm shift. So, the three paradigm shifts again to summarize a the difference between uh, man and animal that that difference is getting blurred every day increasingly. The second difference is between uh, the man animal together organism and machine that distinction also has been um, increasingly problematized in a postmodern world. The third important distinction is the difference between physical and non-physical or the tangible and the intangible, uh, the material and the abstract and the, that division too is uh, being jeopardized uh, in a postmodern world. And again the attitudinal response to that these acts of problematization is often one of celebration, often one of happiness, often one of euphoria. Uh, so, it is not really uh, something that is mourned in a postmodern world that all dissensions in the old order are breaking away. Uh, actually, they are welcome, the, the breaking away is welcomed in a very postmodern celebratory sense. Okay, so, modern machines are quintessentially micro electronic devices, they are everywhere and they are invisible. So, you know this is a very important quality that Haraway is pointing out. The, the ubiquity and the, they are everywhere, the, you know there is no space which is not invaded by modern machines and they are invisible, they are not like massive machines. Uh, if you compare for instance uh, the older computers with the newer ones, so the, the computer is getting thinner by the day, it is getting smaller by the day, you do not actually need a computer anymore if you get a smartphone and you have more miniaturized devices which can do everything for you. Uh, from programming, from emailing, from your social networking uh, activities, uh, from buying things from you, uh, medical services, you know, legal advice, anything. So, you download apps one after the other and apps will advise you on how to navigate with the world around you. And again, this is something that Haraway does not mention because those things were not happening at uh, the point where she is writing, but you know, she seems to anticipate all that uh, from 1984, which was pretty much a time when internet was blossoming uh, as a massive machine. Uh, which will establish uh, a new kind of kinship network uh, between uh, across uh, in, in a globe and across human beings uh, you know uh, everywhere. So, modern machines she says are getting more and more tiny, they are getting more and more miniaturized and they are getting more and more uh, invisible. So, you know the visibility, so one could argue that the visibility and the efficiency are inversely proportional to each other when it comes to modern machines because the more invisible a machine is the more efficient it is. So, you know invisibility and efficiency are equated with each other. So, the flatter, the smaller, the tinier uh, the machine is, the more miniaturized the machine is, the better it is in terms of sophistication, in terms of its efficiency, in terms of its uh, working ability. So, modern machine machinery is an irreverent upstart god mocking the father's ubiquity and spirituality. The silicon chip is a surface for writing, it, it is etched in the molecular scales disturbed only by atomic noise, the ultimate uh, interference for nuclear scores. So, uh, the idea of the irreverent upstart god is a very interesting idea because what and th this goes back to the very idea of blasphemy that Haraway started off with. Uh, blasphemy is an act of irreverence, blasphemy is an act of subversion uh, and uh, the entire the upstart god uh, being a new kind of God which you know is you know perhaps inauthentic, perhaps illegitimate, uh, perhaps uh, subversive and that God, that upset God mocks uh, along with the machines, along with the modern machinery, it mocks the father's ubiquity and spirituality. So, notice the 
small g, the, the, the lower case uh, for g in God, and the higher case, uh, the capital F when it comes to father. So obviously father over here is uh, you know, an example, uh, a signifier of phallogocentricism, uh, the law of the father, the writing of the father, the script of the father, right? And that phallogocentricism, uh, which is a combination of phallocentricism and logocentricism, the father's logic put together, that the ubiquity of uh, the spirituality of uh, phallogocentricism is being mocked, is being subverted by the modern abstract God, which is represented by the modern machines, which are invisible and ubiquitous, they're everywhere. So, uh, you know, new kind of writing, you know, new uh, politics of writing emerge with the modern machines, uh, which, you know, do away with all the distinctions between the law of the father and the law of the subject. So writing, power and technology are the old partners in Western stories of the origin of civilization. But miniaturization has changed our experience of mechanism. So miniaturization, I mean, she, Haraway looks at miniaturization as an activity. Uh, an activity which creates a paradigm, which produces a paradigm shift, because the more miniaturized the machines become, uh, the more subversive they can become, the more um, they, they laugh against the authority uh, of the old father, right? So, and she talks about the three attributes in Western civil, uh, stories of civilization and supremacy, writing, power, and technology. And you can free, see that you know, all these three categories have historically had, historically informed um, narratives of Western supremacy, for instance, imperialism, uh, which is very heavily reliant on all these three categories, technology, power, writing, etc. But miniaturization has changed our experience of mechanism. So the way we experience mechanism, the way we experience our experientiality of machines have been changed uh, dramatically by miniaturization. So what is miniaturization? What is this entire uh, metonymizing quality about machines? So they get more and more metonymized, uh, fragmented and miniaturized. So miniaturization has turned out to be about power. Small is not so much beautiful as preeminently dangerous as in cruise missiles. Uh, contrast the TV sets of the 1950s uh, or the new cameras of the 1970s with the TV wristbands, the hand-sized video cameras now advertised. So again, this is the interesting bit, the historical bit that Haraway is pointing out quite clearly because if we look at the um, change that happened from the uh, sort of mid-70s to the uh, mid-80s, uh, which was pretty much a time when postmodernism was blossoming as a movement, we found that the, the entire uh, grammar of machines and the entire grammar of how you consume machines, that, that changes dramatically uh, with this you know, acts of miniaturization. So if you contrast the old TV sets, which are massive in size, massive in proportion uh, in their physicality, with the new camera of the 1970s, with the TV wristbands um, you know, uh, that we use today, uh, you know, hand-sized video cameras which are used today, again, an act of miniaturization. The small becomes more efficient, so the smaller the camera, the more you can capture. And again, if you just stretch it to the present day, extend it to the present day, we you don't even need a camera anymore because all the quote-unquote smartphones, they have cameras installed in them. So everyone can be a photographer, everyone can use uh, the camera as a means of photography because, you know, it becomes a miniaturized machine in that sense. So miniaturization has created a paradigm shift. Uh, not just that, it's also changed the entire you know, ontology of consumption, the entire ontology of how we look, you know, the ontology of experience, how we experience the world around us. So our best machines are made of sunshine. They are all light and clean because they're nothing but signals, uh, electromagnetic waves a section of a spectrum, and these machines are eminently portable, mobile, a matter of immense human pain in Detroit and Singapore. Uh, people are nowhere near so fluid, being both material and opaque. Cyborgs are ether quintessence. So, you know, this is a point that um, uh, makes uh, cyborgs so interesting, you know, electromagnetic waves. So they, they are not just uh, particles anymore. They're not just matter anymore. They are made of light and, you know, and, 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 and sunshine because they are all waves, they are the combination of waves and particles, which is what you know quantum physics uh, is all about uh, in that sense. So they are a section of a spectrum, and they are portable, they are mobile, uh, so they are fluid. So fluidity, portability, mobility, liminality uh, become very important qualities in modern machines. So cyborgs are either quintessence. So they become very floating uh, fluid signifiers uh, of efficiency, movement, materiality, etc. So cyborgs emerge out of this, uh, you know, quality out of this cultural machines, as, as Harry describes in, uh, you know, this particular section, the three paradigm shifts which take place, which, you know, influence the way we look at machines, which influence the way we consume machines, etc. Okay. 
So the ubiquity and invisibility of Cybox are precisely, so you can see how she's drawing on that modern uh, machines, uh, the ubiquity, the invisibility, the miniaturization, the lack of centricity, and, that, and she's saying you know, all that informs the way the Cybox body, the Cybox efficiency, the Cybox uh, functionality uh, is, is formed. So these Sunshine Belt machines are so deadly. So Sunshine Belt obviously refers to the, uh, the belt, the US, uh, you know, uh, where we have this entire IT boom, the entire uh, technological boom. So the machines which come out of that particular uh, Sunshine Belt, they are deadly precisely because they're invisible. They're deadly precisely because they are almost intangible and they're ubiquitous. They're hard to see politically and materially, so they're not so tangible anymore. They're not so physical anymore. So the tangibility and physicality and corporeality of all the machines are now being replaced by the intangibility and incorporeality, the ubiquity, the invisibility of modern machines. They're about consciousness or its simulation. So you know, it's about human consciousness and, uh, and even worse, even more complex. They're about simulation. They're about mimicking the consciousness. They're about reflecting the consciousness. They're about train patterns. Uh, of human consciousness. They are floating signifiers and moving and pick up rock trucks across Europe, blocked more effectively by the witch weavings of the displays. And so a natural woman of the anti-nuclear Greenham Women's Peace Camp, who read the Sabog Webs of Power so very well, done by militant labor of older masculinist politics. So uh, these machines cannot be stopped by the older you know, models, masculinist labor politics or military politics. They are actually more uh, effectively intervened or effectively uh, engaged with by anti-nuclear Greenhand Women's Peace Camp, which is a, you know, a British camp which was up in arms against uh, the entire idea of nuclear ammunition. So it was an anti-nuclear, uh, it was a nuclear protest, uh, protesting against nuclear acquisition peace camp. So that, that, that peace camp became a very important symbol uh, of not just, um, you know, ecological, uh, you know, resisting against ecological disasters, but also about the feminist movement, um, you know, teaming up against masculine appropriations of power. Uh, the entire masculine hubris of power, etc. So the modern machines are actually more effectively stalled by these peace camps than by older forms of military intelligence. So why do the older forms of masculinist politics struggle to contain these machines? Because their natural constituency needs defense, uh, defense jobs. Uh, ultimately, the hardest science is about uh, the realm of greatest boundary confusion, the realm of pure number, pure spirit. C3I and the uh, preservation of potent secrets. The new machines are so clean and light. The engineers are sun worshippers mediating a new scientific revolution associated with a night dream of a post industrial society. The diseases evoked by these clean machines are no more than a minuscule coding changes of an antigen in the immune system, no more than experience of stress. The nimble fingers of oriental women, the old fascination of little Anglo Saxon Victorian girls with dolls' houses, women's enforced attention to the small take on quite new dimensions in this world. There might be a cyborg Alice taking account of these new dimensions. Ironically, it might be the unnatural cyborg woman making ships in Asia and spiral dancing in Santa Rita, whose constructed unities will guide effective oppositional strategies. So what she's saying is, you know, we are living in a world, we are living in a post-industrial world where real subversion, real oppositional strategies might actually come from cyborgs, might actually come from, uh, you know, bodies which are not so purely human anymore, bodies which are a very interesting entanglement of human and machine, human and animal. So that, that entangled body, that entangled entity, which is increasingly what we are becoming today, you know, might actually contain sites of subversion, might actually contain potential for subversion, you know, uh, rebellion. Uh, against the more um, uh, masculinist paradigms of power. So uh, I'll stop at this point today, but what Haraway is saying, and she sort of maps out three distinctions, three paradigm shifts, uh, the man-animal, uh, you know, the, the organic and in inorganic, and then lastly, uh, the physical and non-physical. So in these distinctions blur away with the rise of modern technology, late 20th century capitalist technology. And with the blurring away of these technologies, uh, blurring away of these maps through the technology, we have the emergence of the cyborg. And a cyborg can emerge as a, a, a potential site of subversion. They can be subversive apropos of older orders of control, older orders of masculinist military control. Uh, and she says quite clearly that you know the sites of the version have changed uh, because the machines have changed. Uh, machines have become more miniaturized in quality, more metonymic in quality, more invisible in quality, uh, and more uh, ubiquitous in quality. And that has done away with the entire idea of the public space. Because you know, prior to the uh, arrival of these machines in the late 20th century, we had a very clear understanding of public space, 
where power uh, was centered, power was located, power was you know, controlled by a few people. But now uh, power is more distributive in quality, power is more democratic in quality because anyone with that machine, anyone with a miniaturized machine can actually acquire power, can actually acquire agency. So agency becomes more distributive in quality, power becomes more distributive in quality, authority becomes more distributive in quality. And this distributive quality is something that Haraway is almost celebrating as a postmodernist. And obviously this is fitting right in, uh, in, a, in the new kind of socialist, you know, Marxist feminism that she's trying to advocate, which is situated against the older orders of phallocentric control and which is situated against any kind of, you know, racial supremacy uh, and it's more distributive in quality uh, in a sense, in, in a way it looks at the world. So machines become uh, agents, machines become active agents of subversion, machines become active agents of intuition. Uh, in a way that a man-machine distinction blurs away completely. And that blurring away, as I mentioned already, is celebrated by Haraway in a very postmodernist spirit as opposed to the modernist uh, nostalgia and suspicion of this kind of you know, breaking of borderlines. So breaking of borderlines is a very important paradigm shift which needs to happen, which is acknowledged, accepted, and celebrated in Haraway's discourse of the cyborg. So I'll stop at this point today and we'll continue with this text in the lectures to come. Thank you for your attention.